Hi everyone. I recently learned how to play the Kali system as white. Very effective, simple opening to learn, great for intermediate players. Um, very rich games. You can get good middle game positions that are understandable with clear plans. And I learned a lot of this material from uh, National Master Robert Ramirez. I also learned from Grandmasters Simon Williams and Ben Feingold. You can try to do some searching on YouTube uh, for their videos. Just search their names and the Kali system. I'm going to talk about much of what I learned from uh, Ramirez in this video. So we're going to start by looking at uh, what the Kali system setup is for white. So the Kali system is a way for you to place your pieces almost regardless of what black is doing. So this is the setup you're going for, these pieces in this order. It may look partly familiar to people who play the London system. In the London system, you do put your pawns on e3 and d4. The knights are here. The light squared bishop is there. The difference is what you do with the black dark squared bishop. In the London system, that gets developed outside the pawn chain to f4. And in the Kali, particularly the Zuckertort variation, you fianchetto the bishop to b2 instead. And we'll talk about the purpose of putting the bishop on this square. What is that bishop going to be doing in the game? Okay, so let's see how we can get to this position and look at a couple possible uh, move orders in the opening, and we'll see what black is doing as well. All right, so let's say we begin with d4. You can actually begin with a lot of different moves, as we'll discuss, to get into the Kali, but d4 is the traditional way to do it. And it's a good system to play against d5, the double queen's pawn opening. Okay, you play knight f3. Black may respond symmetrically. And then if you play e3 here, as soon as you play e3, this is called the Kali system. So you're locking your bishop inside of your pawn chain, and that's what gives this system its name. That's what the Kali is, keeping that bishop back. In this position, you can actually decide to develop it outside the pawn chain. And if you put it on f4, that's called the London system. If you put it on g5, that's called the Torre attack. Uh, Feingold has an excellent video discussing those three particular openings, the Kali, the London, and the Torre. So you can search for that. So the Kali is keeping that bishop back. And the reason we're keeping it back instead of developing it outside the pawn chain is because we have a purpose for it on b2. We're going to be fianchettoing it. Okay, black may respond with e6. It's a common move. Bishop d3, that's where the light squared bishop belongs in the Kali. That's a powerful diagonal. If black castles kingside later, we often get an attack on the h7 square. Now, most players, as the black pieces here, would play c5 at some point. If, if white's not going to play c4 to engage the center, then black usually pushes his pawn forward like this. And that pawn actually comes with a threat. That pawn can go to c4 and disturb our bishop off of its very nice diagonal. We'd have to drop it back to e2. So what we're going to do about that is play b3. As soon as we, as soon as we see that c pawn come forward, we're going to stop it with b3. So we've got that square well defended. There are other ways to play the Kali. As soon as you play b3, this is called the Zuckertort variation. Um, another way to play is actually to push the pawn to c3 to gain this square for the bishop if that pawn should push. And that's not what we're going to discuss, at least not in this video. Um, Lee Chess calls this the traditional Kali when you play c3. Um, I've heard it called something else, though. We may discuss that later in another video. If you do play c3, it's a fine move, and you're plan would be to try to arrange an eventual break with e4 and get the dark square bishop out on that diagonal. But we're going to go for the plan with b3, the Zuckertort variation.
uh, knight c6, common response, uh, castles, bishop d6, sometimes that bishop goes to e7. Uh, whatever black's doing, we pretty much can enact our setup. So we fianchetto the bishop, black castles, and we put the knight on d2 there. The knight is out of the way of our bishop, so the bishop has more scope, and our knight on d2 supports the knight on f3. That's the purpose of that move. So here we've reached this Kali setup that we're going to be studying. So that's one way to do it. Let's look at a different move order. So back up, and let's say we start with d4 again. Knight f6 is sometimes played instead of a double queen's pawn opening. That's okay, you can still enter the Kali setup. You can play knight f3, and maybe e6 here. Um, if you play d5, you're back to what we were just talking about, the double queen's pawn openings. e6 is a common move. Well, you can play e3, and you're in the Kali system. Um, you can do that against anything, really. You can do it against uh, g3, or g6 as well as e6, either of those moves, or d5. All of these moves are allowing you to enter the Kali system, or even c5. Okay, so let's take a look at e6. So we play e3, b6. So this time black is going to refrain from putting his pawn on d5 in this example. That's okay, we continue just putting our pieces on their squares for the Kali setup, bishop d3. And you can do this in different orders as well. Bishop b7, okay, we'll castle, c5, uh, b3, bishop b7, bishop b2, castles, knight bd2, and maybe d6 or d5. And again, we've achieved our setup, even though black was doing something different in that particular line. So let's talk about some of the ideas that come up in the Kali. What are we going to do after we achieve this setup? I'll take a look at this position, and here you can see that white has the setup we've been discussing. He's also developed his queen off the back rank and connected the rooks. Okay, a very thematic move that we are going to like playing is knight e5. We're going to put that knight aggressively in the center of the board. And it's the aggressive way to play this kali zukertort system. Um, and another follow-up move. After black moves, we often push our pawn to f4 to further support the knight in the center and to open up the f-file for a rook lift. So we do want to attack on the king side, and if we get that rook over to h3, then we'll have some pressure against h7. So this is one typical idea in the Kali. Put your knight in the center, push f4, and rook lift. We're going to see that in some games. Let's look at a second idea. So back to this position, another way to play instead of knight to e5 is to push a pawn to c4. This is a more strategic way to play, and if we do that, we have to be able to calculate all the different pawn exchanges and what could happen as a result. And a typical thing that happens here is black can exchange pawns on c4 and then on d4, and then we have this structure called hanging pawns, the two pawns side by side with no pawns on the neighboring files. Those are called hanging pawns. And we'll discuss what to do with hanging pawns in just a little while. But this is another way white can play. Let's look at a third idea in the Kali. So back to this position. So let's go knight e5 again and play aggressively. Let's say black gets the queen developed, connects his rooks, and we go ahead and push to f4 as discussed. Let's say black puts a rook on the c file, and we're going to go ahead and lift our rook, a6, just making some moves for black just to illustrate something. Okay, if we put the rook on h3, we're now putting pressure on the h7 point, and black may not be aware of a typical tactical danger in this position. 
For example, if he continues to expand on the queen side like this, then we've got a nice tactic here. Even though the knight on f6 is defending h7, we can take that pawn anyway with the bishop, called check. Uh, if black moves the king to h8, he's just uh, lined his king up with a rook, giving us some discovered attack ideas, and we're going to give him some long-term pressure, and we're actually winning in that position. And it's even worse if he takes the bishop, because we're going to have a very quick mate with queen to h5. So we're threatening mate right away on h7, and if the knight moves away, then we've got a mate on h8. So there's nothing black can do to keep us from mating him. So that's a typical tactic. Watch out for that attack on h7. Even if this knight is defending it, we can take it. Something to keep in mind. All right, let's look at a fourth idea in the collie. So let's start at the beginning here. Let's play a double queen's pawn opening. Let's play it symmetrically. Bishop d3. It's a very common way to get into the collie setup. Let's say bishop e7, b3, castles, bishop b2, c5, castles, knight c6, knight bd2. We've got that collie setup. This is our ideal setup for our pieces. And now here's the idea I wanted to talk about. Often black is going to take our pawn on d4. If he does that, you do want to take back with a pawn, which to me at first was counterintuitive because you may tell yourself you want to keep that diagonal open for your dark squared bishop. And to tell you the truth, there are cases, there are positions where white takes on c5 to open that diagonal at the right time. But in the opening here, if black takes on d4, we do want to take back with the pawn. And that's because we need to support that very important e5 square. We're going to see the importance of this square in many different examples. So that pawn has to support that square. It looks like we are making our bishop very passive on b2, but that bishop plays a very important role, actually. It's supporting a knight to come to e5. Because, after all, that bishop is defending e5 through the pawn. And this is one of the major reasons for putting the bishop on b2 in this Zuckertort variation. You want to support your knight coming to the e5 square, which is going to help you launch a kingside attack. So the bishop and the pawn would both be supporting that knight on e5. All right, I want to talk about pawn structures. So here's a typical pawn structure in the Kali system. And again, I just wanted to point out, if black takes on d4, we do want to take back with a pawn. And in addition to what we just talked about, notice how taking back with the pawn also opens the e-file for a rook. And putting a rook on e1 is going to help us defend the e4 square and help support a knight on e5. And we can also do a rook lift along the E file instead of along the F file. So this is a very typical pawn structure. Here's another pawn structure. We talked about this when we pushed to C4, that plan, that more strategic plan, rather than putting the knight on E5, we get this pawn structure. And black can give us this hanging pawn formation like this. So you may get these hanging pawns, and you need to know what to do with them. Uh, notice they're controlling a lot of squares in and near the center, making it hard for black to maneuver. Also, a knight on f3 can go to e5, and it's going to be supported by that pawn on d4. So d4 pawn is doing a good job supporting that e5 square. Uh, also, you want to look for ways to push your hanging pawns forward to create a passed pawn. A very normal pawn break that happens is pawn to d5, and then after exchanging on d5, white can often get a strong passed d pawn. One more thing, let's say we pass the move, let's say black makes a move, and 
white can push his a pawn sometimes. So that a pawn is weak, it's isolated, so you want to get rid of it. So common plan is to push it to a5, exchange it for black's b pawn. If black takes our a5 pawn with his b pawn, then all of a sudden our c pawn is a passed pawn. And if he doesn't, well, we can take on b6, and we can saddle black with an isolated weak pawn. And we can even get the a file for a rook. So that's just some of the things to consider in this hanging pawns formation. All right, now that we've talked about it, let's look at a whole game. So I don't know the players of this game. This was presented uh, by Robert Ramirez on his channel. Uh, but let's take a look. So d4, knight f6, knight f3, e6, e3. So that's the Kali system already. This is what Lee Chess would call this. An early c5 was played. That's okay. We put, put our bishop on d3, d5, and now there's a threat to push the pawn to c4. So what uh, National Master Ramirez would tell you to do here is push the pawn to b3 to control c4 but in this game white decided to castle and allow that um, and if he does push his pawn to c4 you're going to have to put the bishop here of course but i suppose then white had an idea of eventually attacking uh, that pawn and if black does push the pawn forward he is releasing the pressure on our center so white didn't mind it and black didn't actually go for that pawn push. He just played knight c6. And at this stage, white pushed his pawn to b3. Bishop d6, bishop b2, castles, knight bd2. So we have our Kali set up. Um, one more thing to point out, once a black castled there, the move a3 is preferred by Ramirez. And he likes this move in order to keep the knight off of the b4 square. So we want to keep our bishop firmly on d3. We want it on this diagonal attacking h7. We don't want to have to retreat it or trade it for a knight. So that's a useful move to keep in mind. But white didn't play that. He played knight bd2. Then queen e7 was played. And now this very aggressive knight e5 posting the knight in the center of the board. Remember c4 was a good alternative to that move and now black plays rook d8 and he's lining up the rook with our queen and he's also giving the king the f8 square as an escape square if he ever needs it. After all white is trying to attack on the king side. Uh, just wanted to point out other options in this position. After you put the knight on e5, you may wonder what happens if black exchanges it. Well, notice he cannot play knight takes e5. That's a blunder, because when we take back with the pawn, we've got a fork, and we're going to win a piece, and that bishop really shows its purpose now. Okay, so that bishop is supporting our knight on that square. And if he takes with the bishop, we are fine with that. We take back with the pawn, and now that's going to drive off that f6 knight. It actually has to go back to the uh, queen side. It has to go to d7 or maybe e8. And then we can push to f4. And we've gained a lot of space on the king side. And this pawn formation here and here uh, divides black's forces into two halves. You see these pieces over here on the queen side. They're kind of stuck on that side of the board. And that means it's going to be hard for black to defend his king. We can do a rook lift here. We can get the queen developed along this diagonal. So don't fear that exchange on e5. Take back with the pawn like that and drive that knight off of f6. That would be fine for us. Okay, but black didn't exchange. He played rook to d8. a3 was played now at this point presumably to keep the knight off of b4. Knight d7, so black voluntarily moves his knight away. Maybe he wants to drive our knight away with f6. Okay, but we play f4 and support our knight in the center with the idea of a rook lift again. And now knight to f8, so now we see black's purpose. He put his knight here on f8, and that's a defensive square. That knight notice is 
defending the sensitive h7 point. Also, if black wishes, he can put the knight on g6, where it can block our diagonal here. Okay, so it's a defensive move. But white plays aggressively, puts the queen on h5, pressuring h7, which is defended for the moment, and then f6 to drive our knight away. However, this is, is going to show the power of white's aggressive position right here. White plays rook f3, sacrificing the knight. And it turns out black actually cannot safely take the knight, which he didn't. He played queen to e8, trying to exchange queens. But let's take a look. What if he did take our knight? Problem is we take back with the F pawn, gaining the tempo on the bishop. And if black wants to stay a piece ahead, he's going to have to retreat that bishop. And now again, we just have too many pieces ready to attack on the king side and black doesn't have many defenders. All of these pieces here are gonna be hard to get over to the king side for defensive purposes. And now white has this open F file. And white just wins immediately here. He takes on f8 with check, removing the defender of h7. Okay. So black cannot take that rook back with a piece. If he does, for example, rook takes f8, then he just gets mated like that. Okay. So black would have to take back with the king but that doesn't work either. White simply wins by getting his other rook into play. The king can go back to g8 and get mated, or black can block with his queen and soon get mated. So white wins that position. So the knight sacrifice on e5 is justified. Black cannot take that knight. So f6, rook f3 was played, queen e8. White doesn't want to exchange queens. He retreats it. C takes d4. E takes d4. Remember, we're taking back with a pawn when he does that. We want to support that e5 square. h5, trying to stop the queen from attacking h7. The other rook comes into play. Now black finally takes the knight. He cracks and White takes back with the f pawn. Bishop e7 hitting the queen, queen g3. Bishop d7 trying to develop, but it's not really working. White, even though he's a piece down, actually has a winning attack on the king side. And that's because black's queen side pieces cannot participate. White has more attackers than black has defenders here. Let's see what happened. Rook f4. Uh, interesting move. The purpose of it is to vacate the f3 square for the knight. Okay. Rook d c8, knight f3, queen d8, creating a battery, controlling h4. Knight g5. Looks like a, another knight sacrifice. That knight doesn't look like it's sufficiently defended. But again, black can't really take it, and black didn't. Black played queen to b6, hitting this point, okay, twice. Let's see what would have happened if black had taken the knight. Well, then there's rook takes f8, check, okay, and that knight was a, a good defensive piece, and now it's gone. Queen has to take back, rook takes f8, check, Rook takes f8, queen takes g5. And black actually has a material balance here. He has two rooks for the queen and a pawn, but white's pieces are just better right now. That's a very bad bishop. The knight is out of play. This pawn is weak. That's a very good bishop. This bishop can reroute to this diagonal. So white is in the driver's seat. The engine says white is crushing. So queen b6 was played. Rook f7, great move. Putting pressure down the seventh rank against black's bishops, and there's pressure against the g7 pawn. The queen and rook are both lined up on that pawn for a potential mate. So g6 was played to stop that mate. 
But then knight takes e6. Looks like another knight sacrifice. Um, white's trying to draw that knight away from defending on g6, so white can come in and mate. Um, but black doesn't take it. Uh, he could also try to take with the bishop. He doesn't do that either. Instead, what he does is he takes the pawn on e5. Notice this pawn is pinned. He's attacking the rook, supporting g6 further. But let's see what would have happened if he had taken on e5 with his bishop, keeping the knight defending that pawn. Well, then you can remove the defender of that pawn with mate to follow, like that. So that knight could not have been touched. So knight takes e6, great sacrifice. So knight takes e5 was played, but then queen takes e5 with a mate threat on g7. Knight takes e6, defending the g7 square. Bishop takes g6 with a mate threat. Bishop to h7 would be mate. Black cracks here. There's really nothing he can do. His position is losing. He moves knight to f4 to break the rook's contact. So bishop to h7 would not be a mate. The rook would fall. But he forgot the knight was actually defending g7, so white mates like that. So white easily broke through on the king side. And we'll look at one last game in this video. Got a lot more to say about the collie, but we'll have to split it up. So this second game was also presented by uh, National Master Ramirez. Um, I do know that Susan Polgar has the white pieces. I don't know who her opponent was, but we'll see how she handles it. And we're going to learn another idea as well. So d4, knight f6, knight f3, d5, e3, e6, symmetric, bishop d3, c5, threatening to push to c4. Remember, we like to push b3 here. That's the Kali Zuckertort variation. Knight bd7. Sometimes that knight goes to d7, sometimes it goes to c6. If you put it on d7, that might be because you want this diagonal open for your bishop. Castles. Bishop e7, bishop b2, castles, knight bd2. So white has exactly the setup we've been discussing. b6, the aggressive knight to e5 again, bishop to b7. And now with that move bishop to b7, black is actually threatening to do something here, positional, that it's, it's a good thing to be aware of as the white player. Black is supporting this knight coming to e4. By putting the bishop on b7 and keeping this knight out of the way on d7, black has two pieces defending that e4 square. And so if white doesn't do something about it, he can sink his knight in on that square. Um, you always have the option of pushing f3 to drive it away or to trade it off. But remember, this pawn would rather be on f4 so we can get our rook lift in here. So here's another idea in the collie to be aware of. Polgar plays queen f3, multi-purpose move. That supports the e4 square. So now white has one, two, three defenders of that square. So knight to e4 is not possible. That's how you stop that move. If you don't want black to play that move, um, not only does that put a knight aggressively in the center, but it also releases black's f pawn, which could come forward maybe to f6 to dislodge our knight maybe to f5 to support his own knight. So queen f3 is a nice move to keep in mind. And not only does that support the e4 square, but the queen can go over to h3 and put pressure on h7. Okay, also the d1 square is vacated, so we'd like to put a rook on the d file, line it up with the black queen here. So multi-purpose move. Okay, black plays rook c8, rook a d1, and black gets the queen off of the d file, even though there are a lot of pieces on that file. It goes over to c7, safe. The rooks are connected. And so now Polgar plays queen to h3, putting pressure on h7. Okay, and just backing up a minute here, instead of queen to c7, I just wanted to remind you that if black ever takes our knight like this, we're happy. We take back with the pawn, 
Um, that just gives white more space. It drives away that f6 knight. And this bishop is doing its job now here, defending on e5. And so black is going to get into some trouble on the king side here. White's going to start attacking. So we don't worry about something like that. Black played queen c7. Queen h3 was the response. So white has a, a very nice idea to keep in mind. It doesn't look like white is threatening anything at the moment because the knight on f6 is defending h7. But white is threatening something. White's plan is to play knight takes d7. Okay, and then when black recaptures, queen takes d7. There's d takes c5. And that opens up the diagonal for the dark square bishop. And if black recaptures on c5 one way or the other, then the bishop on b2 can remove the defender on f6 with tempo and then mate on h7. So again, the threat here is to very quickly remove these two pieces from this dark square diagonal so that we can remove the defender. So you take this knight, so that knight will not replace the knight on f6, then you take this pawn and the diagonal is open and you're gonna take that defender and mate on h7. That's the threat. And that's exactly why black pushed his pawn to h6. So that stops all of that business. Now white plays f4, as we saw earlier. Important idea. Knight e4. So putting the pawn on f4 does acknowledge that um, black can sink his knight on, on e4 and we cannot drive it away with f3 anymore. Um, and now that we moved the queen off of f3, we have less pressure on that square, so that knight is well defended. It's sufficiently defended by the pawn and the bishop. So what does uh, Polgar do about the situation here? Well, she's very tactically aware of what's going on, and she plays a nice sequence. Knight takes d7. Uh, the purpose of this is to draw the queen back to the d file where the d1 rook is placed. Then bishop takes e4. That's how Polgar decided to deal with that aggressively placed knight. Black has to recapture, and now the d file is all of a sudden wide open, and the rook is facing the black queen, so white is threatening discovered attacks by moving the knight. So black played queen b5, and now knight to c4 is a great move. Notice white is up a pawn and he doesn't want to hang on to it. He doesn't want to play c takes b6 because that merely activates the black rook here and black gets that pawn back and threatens the bishop. So instead knight to c4 is a great move because, well, for one thing that opens the d file and that knight can go to that aggressive square on e5 and the knight is defending the e3 pawn, which can be weak in some lines. So it's a great square for the knight. Bishop takes c5. Queen g4. Now there's a mate threat on g7 that has to be addressed. Black decides there's really no great way to address it. He pushes his pawn to f6, which drops the e6 pawn with a check. King goes to h8. And now a crushing move, rook to d7. Anytime you can get your rook on the seventh rank like that, especially with a threat, there's a threat on the bishop, that's got to be a powerful move. And black does crack in this position. Black decides to counterattack instead of dealing with his bishop. He plays rook to c6, attacking the queen. But Polgar makes one move here, and black resigns. Can you find the move? Pause the video. Okay, she plays queen g4, and that's a double threat. There's a threat of mate on g7, and there's still the threat on the bishop, and black can't deal with both, so black has to lose material in the position. So black resigned. Um, just to illustrate the pressure that black was under after rook d7, uh, suppose black decided to move the bishop and attack the rook, saving the bishop. Well, that drops the a pawn, and let's say rook c e8 attacking the queen the queen can go to g4 threaten mate on g7 rook can defend 
But then there's bishop takes f6. And after g takes f6, queen to h4, threatening a mate here on h6. And if the rook decides to defend, you can push the pawn and remove that rook or take that rook. So that's a sample line of all the pressure that black was under. Okay, so I hope you uh, enjoyed uh, what you saw in this Kali system uh, opening video here. I think I'm going to make more. Uh, I have a lot more games and ideas to talk about um, in the Kali. And I'm, I'm going to try it myself. I'm going to play some games and see what I can do with it. All right, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. See you for the next video.